Any of you know my dad, you will know he loves the weather. Whether it's thunderstorms or snowstorms, he always has his eyes glued to the weather radar. And I'm sure if God didn't call him to ministry, he might be a weatherman. Chasing down the storms and reporting on the week's uh, forecast. And man, if only you could see what that looked like. Wait, wait for my earpiece. I hear we actually have a video of what this might look like. Alright, free. See this forecast. update on the weather forecast. It's a 100% chance of snow. Snow could be heavy at times, and it should be beginning about right now. The snow could be beginning at this time now. Very heavy snow falling. There is very heavy snow falling. I'm probably one of the best weathermen in all the world. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Chelsea, in the studio. <laughs> However great a weatherman my dad is, Today, I want to look at a different type of storm. Not a thunderstorm or a snowstorm, but the kind of storms that we all experience in our everyday lives. It's the kind of storms that Dr. Martin Luther King was talking about when he said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and confidence, but where he stands in times of challenges and controversy. That's the kind of storms I'm talking about. In James, the first chapter, 2-4, through four, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when ever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish the work in you, so that you may be mature and complete, and not lacking in anything. When the Apostle James says this about storms, he says, Consider it pure joy, and you're like, Wait! Pure joy? Yeah, James, I'm going to get excited about the storm that I'm facing. Yeah, thank you, James. But he doesn't leave it at that. He continues, and he says, consider pure joy whenever you face storms. You hear that? He says, whenever. He doesn't say if you face storms. I wish he would have said if you face storms, so that there's a possibility I won't face storms, and if I'm in a storm, I have an excuse that, oh, I'm just in a storm. But no, he says, whenever you face storms, Storms, consider it pure joy. And he says, know that when you face storms, something's happening in you. He says, even though the storm is testing your faith, it's producing perseverance and maturity. And it's in these storms, I'll remind you, it's okay to ask why. When there's a storm going on, it's okay to ask why. Jesus asked why. Jesus said, why, oh why, did God have you forsaken me? It's okay to ask why, but be sure that you're willing to obey when you don't get the answer you're looking for. In Romans 8.28 it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It does not say that all things are good or that we won't face troubles in our lives. Because we know we will face hard times. And really, there's no amount of money, there's no amount of fame or position that can keep us from facing hard times. Because we're broken. We're broken people. And when broken people crash into other broken people, we experience this pain and hurt and brokenness. And we experience these storms. It could be a job ending. A company downsizing, maybe layoffs or relationships are ending. It could be sickness, maybe the money is just not there, or you feel alone, or some things the doctor's reports have said have scared you. Or even maybe it's literal storms and destruction they leave in their way. But in Mark 4, 35 through 41, the disciples face a storm. And this was a storm that should have destroyed them. They come to this place where there was nowhere else they could turn but to Jesus. And through that they found peace that surpasses all understanding. I believe in Mark 35 through 41, 
we can learn five principles that will help us when water is coming over the edges and our boat is small. And we don't know what we're going to do with the storm approaching us. And when we experience storms, it leads to fear. Real, genuine fear. It's a real emotion. We all experience it. And it's fear that magnifies these storms and it makes us grab onto control. And we try to say, I got this. I can push through it. Um, and it gives us the security. But really, it's a false sense of security. Because really, control is just a false sense of security. Because there's so many things in life we can't control. I mean, we control what we eat, how we spend our money, how we dress. But we do not control our next breath. And we cannot control our heartbeat. And I mean, sometimes I feel like I try to control my friends, but I really can't. Or some of us might try to control our spouse, but we really can't. Or our children. The fact is, control is a myth. So before we dive into this biblical account from Mark, I want to give you some context. Up here, this is the Sea of Galilee, and it's the same spot Jesus might have been teaching at. And what's funny about the Sea of Galilee is if you really look at it, it's not much of a sea. It's a small body of water. It's nine miles long by 13 miles wide. And if we saw it, we might call it a lake or maybe a great lake. But they called it a sea. But we need to keep this picture in mind because something very important happens between this shoreline and the other side. Jesus had been teaching large crowds by the seaside, and he was using the boats of the disciples that he had called, and he would put them out into the water, and he'd go out in the water a ways, and use this lake as kind of a megaphone to reach more people. And here he told several parables that related greatly with the crowd. He told the parable of the farmer, and the people understood that, and the farmers began to see there was uh, people were farming. Uh, the parable of the lamp, and not hiding under a bushel, People understood that they used lamps all the time. And but most importantly, he used the parable of the mustard seed, which is a really small seed that grows into this large plant that you might not even imagine might turn out something so small. I think it's important because what he was teaching the disciples in that moment was the things they were experiencing right now, and things they might experience might seem small in the moment. But they were going to become great. And they were going to do things that they couldn't imagine they ever did. So then we get to this message in Mark 4, starting with verse 35, and I'm going to read these verses, and as I'm reading it, I really want you to close your eyes and think of what it might have been like to cross the Sea of Galilee. So, I really want us to get in the boat, so I'd like us all to close our eyes, and as I'm reading, pretend like you're in the boat, we're in the boat with Jesus, we're going to cross the Sea of Galilee. Does that sound fair? Alright, let's get in the boat together. Mark 4, 35-41. That day when the day came, he told his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. And a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and the waves, and said, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and was completely calm. He said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey? It may have took the disciples off guard when Jesus told them, we're going to leave this area of great teaching and go to the other side. It might have been like, why? We're doing such good work here. But just like that in our own lives, we might, or he did not tell them what would happen on the way. And just like that in our own lives, we do not know what the future holds. We do not know what circumstances we might face in the near future. And the first principle we really learn from this is our obedience to God's word will be tested. And we will not always instantly understand. Abraham did not understand why God was asking him to do the things God was asking him to do. But his obedience was tested. 
and yet he did not understand he obeyed. The turmoil he must have faced through very tough situations, God brought peace and understanding. And he understood God's grace and mercy and providence. And we can understand that in our lives today. We may not understand first, but we obey first. Understanding comes later. Understand that in verse 35, Jesus said, We are going to the other side of the lake. We're here right now, but we're going to the other side. And if you keep reading, what I find interesting is Jesus gets to the other side of the lake, and he finds this man that's in such mental bondage that he's on the outside of the city, and the city is really exiled from the outside, and he's just in this mental bondage, and he cries out at night, and Jesus goes, and he sets this man free. He crosses the sea for one man, and the town people, they go, hey, Jesus, you're really messing with what we have going on here. We really want you to leave, and so Jesus, being respectful, leaves. He crossed the sea for one man. But I think there's more than that. I think he crossed the sea for the disciples, and I think he crossed the sea for us. You see, there's this message that I think comes out that can even hit us today in 2019, and that when we find ourselves in the midst of a storm, when we find that things are not going to go our way, fear takes control. I want to remind you, though, Jesus said, we're going to the other side. I believe the God we serve is an act of God. I believe he's working in our hearts and in our lives, and I believe he wants to use us to interact with others. But sometimes that activity of God working in our lives is a lot more subtle than we want it to be. And it's just a lot more subtle. And we forget that God is saying, hey, I'm going to lead you to this place that's crossed on the other side. And we forget, sometimes it's even a struggle. And we forget, Jesus said, we're going to the other side. So here's the deal. We're going to the other side. That's what Jesus says in verse 36. He says, left the crowds behind, and we're going to the other side. In verse 37 it says, they encountered a great storm. In Greek, the word is magas which literally translates to fierce, so it's a fierce storm. And what some people might not get from the first time reading the verses is five of the guys in the boat had been fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. This was their livelihoods. This is where they grew up. This is where they spent their days. This was not their first row. They'd probably seen some storms. So for them to say this is a great storm, and right, this is a huge storm, it had to be more of a great storm. It had to be more than just a storm that kind of pops up and slowly subsides. Obviously, it was a large storm. So let me ask you a question. What are the storms that you're facing? And you may wonder, why is God allowing this storm in my life? You might be asking, why cancer? Why this sickness? Why is this happening with me and my friends? Why did I lose my job? Why did I fail a test? Why did that significant person in my life pass away? At this time, Jesus is asleep. And the disciples cry out, Master, don't you care that we're going to perish? How many times have I felt like my prayers were not being answered? And I thought, God, you don't care about the storm in my life. Why aren't you helping me? Why, why aren't you answering my prayers? Why do I feel like I'm crying to nothing? only to understand he was in my boat the whole time. The disciples had nowhere else to turn. They were swamped. And it's the same situation the disciples find in the sea that they built their lives around. Verse 37 says, Great waves were breaking over the boat and filled with water. So what would you do in that moment? Everything in life is crashing down around you and you don't know where to do? Well, some of us may start bailing that water that bucket and bail in that water. And what bailing water looks like today is it looks like saying, all right, I can push through this. You know, I can just do it. I'll push through it. I'm just here right now. I'm going to push through it. Or maybe it's, all right, um, how much money do I have to pay to make this all go away? What, what can I do? Or maybe it's, all right, I'm going to become Mr. Fix-It. I'm going to become Mr. Fix-It, and I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to have to do whatever I have to do. But really, I believe God put the disciples in this position where they couldn't bail. 
those are situations that was bigger than their ability to, to handle. They could not use their skills as fishermen to get themselves out of this. They had to do something different. Just like in our lives, and sometimes we say, I can handle it, I can handle it, but we can't. We can't, and we come to this point, we're bailing, it won't do any good. So what do we do? We do exactly what the disciples do. We wake up Jesus and say, Jesus, don't you care that we're drowning? Don't you care that we're going to die? And Jesus, Jesus was sleeping. And he wasn't fake sleeping. He wasn't like the fake sleeping you do to see what people are saying about you. Or the fake sleeping where you're like, oh, I wonder what the disciples are going to do, so I'm going to pretend to sleep and see how they get out of it. No, he was asleep. He was preaching all day. He was teaching all day. And he was tired. And the disciples had nowhere else to turn. They were swamped. They would, the same stuff they would experience with the fishermen made them have to turn to the only one who could do anything. And this brings us to principle number two. We must be brought to the point when we realize we cannot save ourselves. I find it interesting, though, that the time when Jesus is seemingly silent, the question becomes, what do I do? Or, don't you care we're going to drown? Maybe it's this way for you, and you're saying, I don't know, man. Every time I pray, I feel totally alone, or I feel like my prayers aren't being answered, or God, I just don't know where you are. And a question Jesus asked the storm is, will you trust me even in the silence? Will you trust me even in the silence? Um, a kid at school was going through some hard times, and I was wondering how he was dealing with it. And he, he looked at me and told me a quote that helped me get through it. He said, the teacher is always silent during the test. And I believe that, but I also believe Jesus is more than a teacher. I believe he's our friend, he's for us, and he's in the boat with us. I also believe that it would be much easier if God would speak through giant billboards or he right in the sky what he wants us to do, or even just go, hey, Dylan, I'm talking to you. <laughs> but sometimes when I pray, I feel like all I hear is crickets. <laughs> and I feel like the disciples, I feel like I'm just asking God, don't you care that I'm drowning? Don't you care that I'm going to drown? And I really don't think the question here for the disciples was, are you going to save us? Well, I think disciples are asking something simpler, something that we might, all might have answered. And I've asked God hundreds of times, and it's, don't you love me? Don't you really, really love me? When I'm in the storm, I start asking, God, don't you see what I'm going through? Don't you care what I'm going through? And the thing is, they forget what Jesus said before the storm, which was, hey, we're going to be outside. And I feel the same thing when I'm in the storm. Just like Peter. Peter, he walked on water while he was facing Jesus, and he noticed the waves, and he turned away from Jesus and he sank. I the same thing. I take my eyes off Jesus, turn my back, and I, look, I focus on the storm. And I forget that he's working in me in the midst of the storm. And I know this. I know if I was to boat with disciples, I'd be doing the same thing they were doing. I know this because I don't have a boat. I'm doing the same thing they're doing. <laughs> I forget that he's working with me in the midst of the storm. The Almighty Elijah was led to a brook that God used to restore and feed him. After a while, the brook dried up. Everything he needed was right there. Why did the brook dry up? Well, it's because maybe even Elijah's get to a point where the brook, they worship, they trust the brook rather than more than the God that gave them the birth. We are all going to come to storms in our lives where there's no one else that can help us and restore our broken relationship. There's no one else that can release us from the bonds of addiction. And God allows us to, these things to transpire in our lives that we can be reminded we can't do it ourselves. God allowed these men to get into this place of fear and dread where they had nowhere else to turn. When they have nowhere else to turn, we might think, God, don't you care that this is happening? 
Don't you care that this is happening in my home? Don't you care what the doctor just told me? Don't you care about my anxiety? Don't you care about my depression? Don't you care that I cannot sleep at night? Don't... And he answers, he says, yes. And that's why I'm going to let you exhaust all your resources until you willfully depend on me. I once heard the story of a boat racer, and he was racing his boat, and it flipped, and the boat plunged in deep, way underwater. And he did what everyone else does. He started swimming frantically, and he didn't know which way was up and down, and he'd swim real hard, and he'd hit the bottom of this lake, and he'd try to go up from there, and he'd swim left, and he'd try to turn around, and swim right, and he did this until he was exhausted, until he was just about to give up, and he became calm and still, and then he felt the pull of his life jacket. And through that pull of his life jacket, he was able to swim up and make it back to the surface. Sometimes we're fighting, we're fighting God, and we have to come to this end, we're fighting with all we got. We have to come to this end until we feel the pull of the Lord, which is the only way to be saved. There's another Old Testament story about Elijah, an old widow. An old widow had resided to use the last of her resources, oil and flour, to make a cake and face her demise. How brazen and selfish it might have seemed when Elijah came to her and said, Hey, I know you're using the last of your resources to make this cake, but can I have a piece of it? And she just had to trust Elijah. He was the man leading God in her life, and Elijah asked her to go get as many pots and pans as she could draw to go to her friends and borrow pots and pans, and he's told her her oil would not run out. And I just want to tell you, when you run out of natural resources, turn, turn to him and be shown supernatural resources. And this brings us to point number three. God seeks to display power in our lives. God seeks to display his power in our lives. When a storm hits your life, he wants to display his power in great storms. Great storms need great calm. And he is the exact amount of peace for the exact time you need. So, at this time, Jesus is asleep. The disciples have said, don't you care, we're going to die. So Jesus gets up, and he goes up to the waves, and he basically says, sit down and shut up. And there, there wasn't any like gradual, like, rolling of the waves. No, it says the waves went, all of a sudden, silence. It stopped suddenly. And it says there was a great calm. There was a great storm. Jesus stopped the storm. There's a great calm. It's hard to stop in the midst of the storm and know God is with us. But Jesus was telling us, I'm in the boat. I'm for you, and I'm with you in the things that you're going through. And we know this because in verse 40, he asks a very personal question. He asks the disciples, why are you so afraid? And to us, he's asking a similar question. He's asking, how is it that you still don't trust me? Think about all the times I've helped you along the way, and you still don't trust me. And he's saying, do you still have any faith? Is how do you still have no faith? And he's not saying like, well, if you had more faith, you could have told the storm to stop yourself. No, he's saying faith is knowing Jesus cares for us in the midst of the storm. Faith is knowing that when the howling of the wind is so deafening that you can't even think, Jesus is with us and he cares about us. That's the kind of faith Jesus is talking about. Principle number four our faith must grow. We do not like to be stretched. We'd like to stay in our comfort zone, but if you stay comfortable, you'll never grow. That's why there's things called growing things. And some of the younger ones in the crowd might not understand this, but it's a great quote for those of you. We, like good pictures, we are developed in the dark and in the sea and the light. At the end of verse 41, it says the disciples were completely terrified. Well, duh. I mean, this guy just stood up and was told the winds and waves to stop, and now there's a great silence. 
But the actual translation isn't terrifying. It's great fear. There was a great storm, great calm, and now there's great fear. Because the only thing scarier than a great storm is knowing that you're standing in a boat with a great God way bigger than you. Way bigger than me, way bigger than any storm. And I think it was a display of love that Jesus told his disciples, I love you enough to meet you right where you're at. I love you enough to meet you in the middle of the storm. And I believe that here today, there are some of us facing our own storms. And you may not clarify them as a mega storm, but just like the disciples, you may not you may not consider it a mega storm just like the disciples, but we here, we go to the church and we put on this happy mask. We put on this happy mask and we're happy at church and we go home and we take that mask off and we're still struggling. We're still struggling. Well, I wonder what would happen if we took scriptures like Psalm, if we took scriptures like Psalm 18.6 really to heart and it says, in my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help, and he heard me. Psalm 121 says, When I call on the Lord in my distress, he answers me. What if we actually started doing that? You see, your storm is no less important than the storm the disciples are facing. The disciples, they, they feel as they're going to die. But your storm is no less important to God. It's no less important. And that brings us to principle number five. God wants to be God in our lives. And that's why we face storms. He wants to be in control of the steering wheel. Two people trying to control one steering wheel can be very dangerous in a recipe for disaster. Driving, driving down the road, um, you may see some of these stickers and they say something silly. I mean, it's all in, they mean good, but it says, Jesus is my co-pilot. If you really think about that, if Jesus is your co-pilot, you're sitting in the wrong seat. <laughs> Jesus should not be a co-pilot. You should be a pilot. You should be a co-pilot. Or maybe not even pilot at all. There's a Toby Mac song that says, I want to be a backseat driver. I want you to take the wheel, and I just want to be along for the ride. God wants to be God in your life. And only He can get the glory when we face a dark storm and experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. So, as we end this message, as the invitation song plays, I want us to have a time of prayer and worship that we would know God is with us in the storm and that we cannot do it without Him. Uh, when I worship, I really like to raise my hands. And I'm not saying that you have to, but the reason I raise my hands is I'm, I'm really saying, God, I can't do this without you. I surrender to you. I, I can't do it without him. I don't want to do it without him. So, Lord, I pray as, if, as we go into this song, Lord, that whatever storm that we might be facing, and wherever we find ourselves, I pray that we would let the words of the song just wash over us because, Lord, we know we can't do it on our own. And no matter where we are, you meet us and you walk with us. So thank you, God, that we know we're not alone. It's his name.